Well hello everyone and you join us here today in a little bit of a heat wave. So of course we've chosen the person to talk to who is least likely to survive it. Ricky from Scottish Watches Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. As we discussed off air, I have got a personal <laughs> air conditioning unit in the other room so I am fine. I'm also not ginger. I am skinhead approaching baldness so I am doing absolutely fine up here. Well, I'm glad to hear it because uh, it's getting a little bit warm in here. I've had to shut the window so I don't get the external noise uh, coming to the mic and I'm, I'm already starting to feel it. So, uh, yeah. But, but Ricky, we're here to talk about you. We're here to talk about what you do. Scottish Watches Podcast. How did it all begin? It started as a joke, which is probably the best when it still is a joke. <laughs> uh, many years ago, perhaps coming up four years ago, I was at a store launch event, started speaking to somebody there we never knew each other. It was uh, glances exchanged across a glass table, looking at second-hand Daytona watches, things like that. <laughs> and we came up with that. Well, I came up with the idea. You know, why don't we do a funny, irreverent podcast to do with watches? There weren't that many around at the time, and they were all very serious. Yeah. You know, they weren't fun. They weren't. There was nothing humorous about it at all. And I've always been of the opinion that hobbies should be fun, and this is a hobby, mm. an expensive one, albeit, but still a hobby. And we launched. It was fine got some good listenership numbers at the start but then we got some features we worked with Ariel Adams at Blog to Watch, we ended up in the New York Times uh, Hodinkee talked about us Dubai Watch Week talked about us and it just grew and grew and then during the Covid years because people were kind of locked up, cooped up at home, they had a lot of spare time in their hands so we just kind of got bigger and bigger and the audience we've got is universal, it's right across the entire planet Around about 40% UK, 40% America, and then the remaining 20% spread across all four corners. So that's how we ended up here today. Wow, nice. It sounds like you're a busy boy, so thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Yeah. Um, we've always been a big fan of yours, and in fact, when we got started, one of the big realisations that we had was very similar to what you've just said, is that the industry takes itself and the people around it take it very, very seriously. And, and your podcasts were always a bit of a respite from the uh, the otherwise very kind of furrowed brow approach that people take to discussing watches and, and collecting and all that kind of stuff. So, first of all, thank you for that. Yeah. Second of all, the industry itself is very, very serious. How have you managed to grow and work with an industry that can be very protective? Well, because we had no industry insider knowledge, information, we didn't work and we don't work in the watch industry. We're still outsiders. Nobody... <laughs> nobody controlled us we had no paymasters so unlike certain large blogging magazine podcasting youtube entities in the states <laughs> we weren't beholden to rolex paying us 12 million dollars a year and telling us what we could and couldn't say and it just went from there the brands didn't know who we were to start with now pretty much they all do they've all heard of scottish watches scottish watches podcast and when we've been to events like dubai watch week when we've been across to Botches and Wonders, where I met you for the first time, both you guys, yeah. uh, put a face to the sound. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were. people knew who we were. People actually knew our voices before they knew who we were, including yourself. You wandered over because I think you'd heard me speaking. <laughs> yeah. And it's been great. But since we launched, people have picked up on us along the way. First of all, it was the smaller guys, the micro brands, the ones that didn't have much to lose by maybe coming on the show and having us taking the piss out of them a little bit, which we do. But more recently... We've done a lot with the Richemont brands, we've done episodes with Vacheron, we've done a mini-series with Mont Blanc, we're doing another mini-series with IWC, we've done Grand Seiko, it's all over. And the brands, they're starting to get the message now, and I think COVID softened the world. Swiss brands didn't use tech before COVID happened, you couldn't get somebody in a Zoom call, we couldn't get a CEO in a Teams call, now we can. Mm -hmm. because it's opened up they're more attuned to social media memes things like that and yeah, yeah all the brands love us even when we call them out and we even call out our friends so when Oris or Arash do something funny or Bremont do something funny we call them out but we get on with them keeps the sort of checks and balances on the way that's what i liked about you guys from the start was that it's it's fun to like nudge the brands every now and then you know because what they do is funny and absurd sometimes so you have to point it out yeah and i think it's worth stating as well and i'm saying this for the benefit of um tom and ricky but also for any brand people who might be listening when you get to say something and you get to have a dig and you get to point out a flaw it means when you say something positive 
people will believe you. If you always say things that are positive about everything, then it just comes across like an advert, doesn't it? So, uh, and, and that's why really your opinion has always been so valuable to us compared to other people that you may have uh, <laughs> implied a few moments ago, <laughs> because you know what, I, I know what you're saying is truthful. Yeah, I mean, one of the big stories that we've had in a brand that we work with a lot and you've had success with was way back in the beginning, Oraj, independent mm -hmm. Swiss brand. They sent us a watch to look at way, way, way back before COVID, end of 2019, the year we launched. And my co-host at the time, he loved the watch. I hated the watch, I thought it looked terrible. I think it was the Autark and it had this carbon dial, I think it was. And I said it looked like a bin liner, <laughs> a black bin bag in the sunlight. And instead of this brand going crazy and saying, that's it, they're scored off, they're blackballed, we'll never speak to them again. They emailed me and said, well, we do other watches, we'll send you more. There must be one in there that you like the look of. Yeah. Yeah. They stood up, they, you know, they came to the fore, they sent more watches across. I really liked a few of them. They've got one that's basically a carved out crater of meteorite. Oh, wow. You know, they do some really, really funky stuff. And then I started speaking positively about those ones and they never had their noses put out of joint. Yeah. Fast forward a couple of years when they launched their Turbion project, I get one. You guys have reviewed one and last week, the week before, we were over in Beale with them. They were showing us their manufacturing facilities and how they're going from strength to strength. They were the guys that provided the technology and the movement capabilities for Bremont for the ENG 300. So they're made, moving forward. They're a big mover and shaker in the industry and they're like us. They tell the truth. They don't sugarcoat it. And if there's a problem, they open up and tell you about it because the, what I've found is watch people, unlike any other community or enthusiast group, they're educated. Mm -hmm. People that are into cars, they can be educated. People that are into motorcycles, they can be educated. Football people, they can be educated. Watch people definitely are. Because you wouldn't sit there and watch videos, listen to an hour's worth of podcast about a certain subject that would be boring to the layman unless you were really into it and you had all your brain cells working and firing in the correct order. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's a good place to be and the brands get on well with us. And I think we've only ever had one brand say, we didn't like that meme that you made about us. But we stopped doing those memes about that brand and we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's very interesting what you said about the brand softening. Um, and, and I do believe that in the growth over the last few decades of a lot of brands, there is a feeling within of we have something popular and we don't really know why and we don't want to touch it and we don't want to do anything with it because we might break it. And personality is something that can make something that's very fragile grow really well or fall apart. And sometimes you see a lot of watch brands, especially big, well-established ones, not have personality. And something that you've described with Haraj there, I think, is that a lot of these smaller brands are capable of growing alongside a really interesting personality that has its pluses and its minuses that feels human and connected. That's really where watches sit well for me. I'd be interested to know in your experience how some of those bigger brands have started to evolve more to your way of thinking. I, I think it's just a general softening. There's more humour, there's more fun, and even in watch designs, I've seen a change. I've only been into this for about five and a half years. I came in, baptism of fire, within three months of buying my first luxury watch, I was at Basel World checking stuff out. When I started, I didn't realise Rolex made more than one watch. I just thought there was a Rolex watch. That was it. That's how little <laughs> I knew. And Jesus, things kind of just accelerated from there. And I always say that I'm an enthusiast, not an expert, because I don't believe yeah. I am anywhere near five years in. I'm nowhere near the level of half the guys, a quarter of the guys that we speak to on a daily basis. That's quite a short amount. So that's two years before you started the podcast. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Because we started the podcast... 13th of January 2019 and it was March 2017 that I went across to Basel World, having no clue. What had happened was, the, the quick sort of uh, entry story into how I got into watches because it's been told a thousand times, I'll tell it quickly. It came up for Christmas, end of 2016. I had some spare cash. I had a house, a car, a motorbike. What's a guy buy next? My dad had always said he'd love to have a Rolex watch. We didn't have much in the way of uh, extra amounts of cash lying around when I was a kid, so obviously I never had one. I had some spare cash. My dad had passed away a number of years before, and I thought, you know what? I'll get a Rolex watch. That'll be cool. Bought one. Didn't work. It was running like a minute, two minutes fast per day. It was a 1999 GMT Master. And I thought, oh, that's weird. It was going to go back, but I wondered what was going on. Being mechanically minded into cars, technology, motorcycles, went on Google's. Had a look around, why is this not working? Found the Rolex forum, read, read and read more. 
found Watchbox, found Watchfinder, found all these different places, YouTube channels, videos, and something in the back of my head woke up that hadn't been tickled for a while. A new hobby had appeared in front of me. And I just went completely deep. Um, you know, Ben Clymer likes to go effing deep, and I went bod deep, which is a Scottish variation of that. <laughs> and I booked a ticket to Basel World. Three days before I went to Basel World, I got a call from my AD, who had stupidly taken down my details and put me on a waiting list that I didn't ask to be put on for a Batman. So I got the call for a Batman <laughs> I wasn't expecting. Panicked because six and a half grand's a lot of money when you're just getting a new hobby. Obviously now looking yeah. at things, it's like, oh, yeah, I find that down the back of the couch for most people that buy watches. <laughs> Took my brand new watch, three days old, back to Switzerland, went to Basel World, saw brands that I didn't know existed. Carl F. Booker, IWC, Blancpain, all these different things, and they were doing explanations of how movements work. They had master watchmakers with microscopes up to big televisions. It was like going to candy stores the first time, and I say it's like going to your first rave, your first concert, your first football match. It just blew my mind. Probably more so than those things there. The first car show I ever went to, going to Basel World, was how my career has now changed because I do Scottish watches over 40 hours a week. Two episodes a week, it takes at least 20 hours to plan, prepare, set up, record edit, produce, upload, all the stuff that goes into it. And if it wasn't for that one trip, if it wasn't for that one broken Rolex watch from a dealer in Scotland that I will not name, then I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Amazing. That's quite the story, yeah. And little did you know, walking into Basel World that first time, that you would slowly pick apart all of those brands into very tiny pieces. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Speaking of which, do you guys do wrist checks? Uh, well, not really, because we're usually wearing exactly the same thing. Yeah, Andrew's got the <laughs> same watch, and I've just got nothing worth talking about. What are you wearing, Ricky, then? I can see something swirling around inside the dial every now and then when you lift your arm up. Yes, I am colour-coordinated today, so I have a red T-shirt on, and I'm wearing the Mad One Red Edition from Max Busser. We're not, I don't know if we're allowed to say MBNF. It is an MBNF. Those are the guys that put it together. Yes, it's got a Myota movement inside it, but it's the same very skilled work people that put this together. Uh, fantastic piece, limited edition. I think there was 25,000 people entered a lottery to have the opportunity to buy one. And I'm very wow. honoured and privileged that I managed to get one of these. And the only reason I managed to get it was... When the first one came out, the blue edition a year ago, we'd had Max Busser on our podcast. And when mm. he announced this, I emailed straight away and said, listen, I know that this is out. Uh, how close a friend of MBNF do you have to be to get one? They said, sorry, Ricky, they're all gone. They were for our designers, our helpers, our collaborators. But, you know, we'll keep your details on file. And if we do anything in the future, we'll let you know. And it just felt like one of those applying for a job. We'll keep your details on file. Yeah. <laughs> so I never thought anything of it. Then they announced the red edition, and I keep calling it the red one, which is the wrong name. And I got an email the same day saying, hey, Ricky, how's it going? We kept your details on file. If you would like one, because you asked a year ago, then here's a link. Go buy it. If we don't hear from you within a few days, we'll pass this opportunity on to someone else. And I jumped out of bed and within 11 minutes of receiving the email, I had it bought. And then it arrived about a month later. So this has been in my rotation ever since. And uh, there's quite a few of them in the secondary market at exorbitant prices. I'm just happy I've got this one. I'm definitely not going to flip it. Nice. Yeah, I like I like the fact that you managed to wangle one by actually asking Max Busa <laughs> as well. That's it, of course, yeah. I think Max might be one of, if not my favourite person in the watch industry. What he's, what he's done for the industry and what he continues to do is just fantastic. Um, what, how did you find him? I found him sober in Dubai at Dubai Watch Week and like you say he is fantastic in real life I think two or three times he's been on the show he was introduced to us through Barbara Plumbo who works for Revolution Vanity Fair and many many other things she's a fantastic co-host and a good friend of mine Max when we met him in real life was so down to earth chilled relaxed we talked to you about anything the culture out in Dubai watchmaking over the decades it didn't matter we spent a lot of time with him over there and he's just so approachable, honest, and you get a warm feeling speaking to him. Not to discredit anyone else. And I wouldn't like to say he's my favourite person in the watch industry because Jean-Claude Biver is also so charismatic and can be the best storyteller in the room. And there's many other people as well that we've spoken to that are just as 
equally fun filled and not about the tech spec and the sales figures. Yeah. Mm. So th there are a lot of nice people out there that can speak eloquently, like you guys, on your videos. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> With much editing. <laughs> what is your take on the whole Moonswatch saga from, from day dot to now? Oh, this is a road well travelled, especially in the last 48 hours since I've recorded a podcast <laughs> and a YouTube live on it. <laughs> I think... Moonswatch, it was a happy accident. It was a viral sensation in the genuine way of it. It was never planned. If it had been planned, they would have had more than 150 watches per store to sell to the thousands stood outside. They did very well out of it. They continued to do well out of it. And they have kept the lightning in the bottle without it escaping. And every time it looked like it was starting to fade, they would do something. Most recently, Nick Hayek's comments to Fratello Watches about something, I'll paraphrase because I don't have it in front of me. We're going to keep the moon swatch in store only we're not going to put it online because it's a finely crafted swiss thing it's not a consumer item and we want you to have emotion when you come into this into the shop the bricks and mortar to buy it mm. and i thought yeah that's okay but you can go to omega.com and you can buy a real moon watch for four yeah. or five six grand so why is there no emotion with that versus your plastic version or any other swatch and any other swatch and that was the thing that I thought was the only thing we could take him to task on. But it's marketing, it's PR. And as I've explained to a whole load of people who are really pissed off about the fact they can't buy a plastic watch online. You know what? See, if I had a business and I found a killer product and it was driving people into a bricks and mortar store that I own and operate, that has staff, that has costs, it's been derelict for a couple of years due to COVID and it's driving footfall in. Yeah, people come in and they say, can I have the moon swatch? Sorry, sir, we don't have that anymore. Well, I'm here now anyway. Oh, I like the look of this. I like the look of that. I love one of them. I love one of those. Hmm. That's business. All these companies are businesses. Richemont, LVMH, Swatch Group, Rolex Charity. Yeah, if you say so. But generally, the watch industry is an industry. It's not a commune. It's not people sing singing Kumbaya and doing stuff for free. So if I had a killer product, would I hell shove it online? I would be driving people into my stores as much as possible until the very, very end because that is business 101. So I think they've done everything right. Could they have done it better? Perhaps, but they didn't know. A day before all the hullabaloo happened and there was a massive queues, nobody knew there was going to be queues that big. Me and Dave had a heads up it was going to be busier, but we had a plan of going down to the only swatch store in Scotland that would have it, which is Edinburgh one. He drove down at five in the morning and saw a couple of hundred people queued up already and we knew they only had 150 watches because we were told beforehand. So he drove home and then the queues grew and grew and grew and grew, especially all across the world. It's one of those things, if you look at the figures, Omega stores, boutiques, are now up 50% on sales because of the renewed interest in watches and mechanical timepieces. And that is a good thing. And like Rolex and everybody else, it raises the bar and it raises interest levels in the entire industry and community. There's not a bad thing to say about it. Yeah, there was a few people that got scalped in the beginning, got a watch for a couple hundred quid, sold it for a few grand on eBay. Good for them. The fact it's hit the headlines, the fact it was in Financial Times, it was in Bloomberg, it was in this, that and the other. And to this day, what we are at, middle of July, for something that happened in March, and we're still talking about it. And the, the normal media, the hype beast guys, they're all still talking about it. It can only be good for the watch industry, as it's proven. And I think it only really exists because of the state the industry is in at the moment. You know, the most obvious example of that being the Rolex store window that says for display only. How do you think the industry is and, and, and where it's going? <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> as I hold up my new Rolex watch that I picked up a couple of weeks ago after waiting three years. Um, how do I see things going? Yeah. Very difficult to say because things keep changing and things that we, we see today are the knock-on effects and the resonation and echo of something that happened two years ago. Watches that we were talking about uh, in the last few weeks, they've been on the design board, they've been on the roadmap with companies for a number of years, and it's only now that, a couple of years down the line, that supply chain problems through COVID, and most recently Ukraine, are starting to rear their ugly head. We've been speaking to brands that said, yeah, we knew we'd be fine up until around about now because that's where all the moving parts, suddenly we've got this gap, this problem, and it's going to be funny for the next year, I reckon, with things. Some micro brands are going to come, some micro brands are going to go. The, the big players are probably going to all hang around where they are. Nothing has really changed much. I think Breitling are probably the biggest player that have changed in the last couple of years, maybe the last three years that they're not just the John Travolta pilot watch anymore. <laughs> thank God. You know, thank God. <laughs> you know, they've got it together. They've even got new releases. Um, was it the Super Ocean the last couple of weeks there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
that again they're getting headlines people saying oh don't like this don't like that but it's a headline and somebody will like it or somebody will go well i don't like that i wonder what else they do so i think it's a really good time obviously there has been a slight softening of the market with the big hype pieces and people are saying is that linked to the fact cryptos fell in its bum nfts are starting to disappear thank god i don't know I see it as a ever so slight softening. It was never going to last at the, the peak levels it was going to. It was a bit like the roller coaster. It was climb, 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 and then it's going to dip ever so slightly at the top. But no, I absolutely love this community, this hobby. And every time I get a new watch sent to me for review, it always fills me with joy opening the box to see what's happening. An example a year ago was the Studio Underdog watermelon watch. One guy young guy starting out on his own worked for a brand that did cheap kids plastic darth vader watches and then he, he just decided to go nuts during covid and wow what a reception that thing's had things like that fill me with joy and that's an inexpensive watch i think they're around about four or five hundred quid yeah we, we recently spoke to uh to richard and he yeah really interesting guy and it's great to see that the industry now where people might suggest that things are becoming harder and harder to get for the average enthusiast actually there's at the other end there's so much more arriving and so much more opportunity to see great brands coming about and i really hope that the next decade we as we see brands like rolex become more and more popular with a mainstream audience it's backfilled by some really really good micro brands that uh like like garage the the, the, the most affordable swiss tourbillon you could have never have expected that 10 years ago no and the thing is to to drop in a little bit more about them it was only after going and visiting them and spending a week that we learned that the guys behind Arage have worked in the industry for decades but they don't talk about it they, they even were quite quiet with us and I probably shouldn't speak out of school but they have supplied technology and brain power to some of the biggest Swiss brands ever and they're now doing their own thing so they didn't just appear 10-12 years ago and go we're making a movement sugar we need to have a watch to go with it They've got a lot of brain power. The stuff they are doing, the stuff they showed us, <laughs> the tolerances that they are working with with their partners are in the micron levels. Up to three microns, plus or minus. That is insane. A micron, I believe, is like the seven, a 70th of a human hair. And I don't have many hairs, so I can't really count that myself. But <laughs> it's just, it's, it's insane how that is gone. And there's all these other micro brands that have appeared out of nowhere. We deal with all the British guys. We are part of the British Clock and Watch Makers Alliance working with Roger Smith and Mike France, who's at Christopher Ward, and they've opened their eyes up to brands that even we didn't know about. There's like Studio Underdog we spoke about, Isotope, William Wood, Zero West. So many British brands out there that are doing things that are completely different looking. They're not all sub homages that we saw from the Kickstarter guys just two, three years ago. So the industry, the community is in a really, really good place. And now that we're getting on the back of the COVID situation, it can only get better. You've touched on something there as well that I think will be a lot of the growth of the industry over the next few years is transparency. So many of these uh, industry insiders have been working for bigger brands, doing things B2B, if you like, and now have the capability to do it themselves. And we're starting to see more and more about how those bigger brands, the reality of their assembly. And I think that we will see pockets of those um, be able to claim full ownership of what they do compared to others who, uh, when you start to peel back the layers, you realise it's it's assembled through a lot of different brands working for them. Well, I have a comment on that one, and I don't know if you've been earwigging in my conversations because it's something I brought up quite recently, and that is, if I was to buy a product, say I was buying a car, yep. I wouldn't expect the car maker to make the bulbs and the wires and the fabric and the blah 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 I wouldn't expect that yeah. if I'm buying a Porsche I know inside that there's going to be technology from Denso from Bosch from Valio from all these different manufacturers who are the best at what they do bring it all together and it's a great product I would rather if I was buying something that was luxurious or expensive or both that the best person ever was doing that part so buying a watch where they made the, the sapphire they made the hairspring they made the hands they made everything well you can't be a master of everything mm -hmm. so i would rather they use the best people in the world for those individual parts and then they assembled those best individual parts together to make the best watch possible and the transparency thing is good again i'm not going to harp on about Raj, but they showed us behind the curtain 
they did the Wizard of Oz thing and on the podcast we recorded with them you could hear them saying this is the company we work with and their marketing guy's like you don't want to say that you don't want to say that and Andy the owner's like I don't care I'm going to tell people the truth I'm going to tell them who's behind this that's great that isn't it and and, and to, to your point as well some of my favourite brands and favourite people another favourite person uh, Anthony de Haas when we saw his presentation at Watches and Wonders he was saying we don't make the hands we don't make the dials because our expertise is in making the movements Perfect, great. As long as the dial and the hands are built to the quality that you expect for the product, perfect. And to go back to, to neatly tie this all in a little bow, to go back to MBNF. When MBNF first came out, the idea of him, in fact, before that, with the uh, Harry Winston Opus pieces, the idea of bringing in different people to work on your product and the best people seemed like craziness back then, but now it's the very essence of the MBF brand. And that transparency, I think, is a really good benchmark for the industry as a whole. Well, with that being said, thank you so much, Ricky, for joining us. Uh, Div, you're a listener. If you want to get more of Ricky's brand of Scottish humour and uh, <laughs> rib poking of the brands, do head on over to scottishwatches.co.uk. Listen to all 379 podcasts there, and then you can look forward to listening to the rest. Thank you so much, Ricky. Yep, and you can get that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Amazon Music, and all good podcast players. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Well, thank you very much, and uh, until next time. Indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. Catch you later.